Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. We are recording <laughs> live. All right. So we're going to call to order the September 1st, 2021 meeting of the Services Committee. Can I get a roll call? Um, Mr. Fisher? Here. Mr. Elliott? Mr. Kappel? Here. John. All right. Um, need to uh, make a motion to approve the August 4th <clears throat> meeting minutes. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Do we have any visitors? Do we need roll call? Oh, yeah, we need a roll call. <laughs> Um, let's see, Mr. Fisher? Yes. Mr. Kappel? Yes. Mr. Elliott? Mr. St. John? Yes. I'm, I'm a visitor. I'm He's sorry. Right. I am. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, he just sits in the big chair. That's all. <laughs> um, big chair. Uh, we don't have any visitors, do we? Not okay. that I'm aware of. No. All right. So we can get on to the issues. Um, so the Sunbury Estates. Sidewalk repair and replace plan. You said, Steve, that you had something to present on that. Yeah, there's uh, a memo in your packet. Uh, apologize for it being late. It was something that would have been done yesterday, but we kind of had some intervening variables. Um, I did have the opportunity to meet with the ODNR urban forester. She had some interesting ideas. Probably the important part was the large maples that are in that area uh, are in need of an eight foot tree lawn instead of a six foot to five foot, which is what they have. Um, and then she probably knew a lot of good information. So it's still the options that I see at this point. We have a current ordinance, uh, repairs are at the homeowner cost and we can implement the assessment process as a way for homeowners to pay over time. Um, the cost of doing that is roughly equal to slicing the sidewalks and replacing the panels that are in excess of the 1.5 inches. And this was a front and back memo that this one didn't get copied. Am I? Uh, <clears throat> no, no, there was there was a back to the memo. Oh. Um, so the third option was to do either slicing and the um, panel replacements, and then if once we the urban forester said that once we remove, like we're gonna have to replace a panel because of a tree, we can open up that panel and see what's going on underneath. If it is a major buttress root that's coming through there that's created that situation, or if it's settling or something else unrelated to the tree. Um, but she said, if, if we run into buttress roots, she gave me some guidelines most communities don't allow a root of three inches in diameter. Some are up to four inches to be cut because then you're um, injuring the stability of the tree. And that, you know, if at, when we discover that, we could talk to that homeowner if they're really wanting to keep that tree. The idea of a, a sidewalk meander that would create another two feet, give the, give the, eight foot space that the tree needs, but it would include the homeowner recognizing that the meander is gonna be onto their property to give that tree, to save that tree and keep that tree alive. What do you mean by that, like the sidewalk would just curve around? On yeah, it would just, it would just meander slightly okay. two feet off the current 
length, which is the six foot tree lawn. So we create a temporary eight foot tree lawn around that, that large tree to give it the space that it needs. Uh, she said there are some communities doing that. Um, I included the range of, there's a lot of communities that are taking ownership of street tree damage and paying for that. Um, there are some communities that take ownership of street tree. I think it was Hilliard takes ownership of street tree advantage of uh, damage, but then they, they take the tree kind of, as I talked about before, um, they take the tree and replace it with something that's more appropriate for the space that it has to grow in. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them, and we are a tree city USA, so we should probably do our best to save those trees as much as we can. So those would be kind of the three options that I would uh, foresee presenting to the neighbors to get their input. <clears throat> there is a, a slab jack and kind of a hydraulic option that can be used to, to kind of alter the sidewalks, maybe get some matching instead of slicing. Upper Arlington uses that. We actually found some evidence that someone privately had gone ahead and used that on one of the sidewalks out there in some various states. What is that? It, it's called slab jacking or hydraulic adjustment and you, you <clears throat> bore a hole in the sidewalk, you, you know, put a spout in it, and then under pressure you put a, put a mix of uh, usually cement liquidized um, and it can hydraulically, they can kind of adjust the sidewalk that way. Oh, okay. so, so one person's already done that? Yeah, one person's used that approach to get their sidewalks trued back up. So kind of surprised, but we'll walk around. Does it look good? I mean, does it look good? It, it leaves a little, you know, a little different colored hole. Well, it's not a hole. They, they you know, smooth it out at the surface, but it um, just a little contrasting hole, maybe about, you know, get a golf ball through maybe. But it does the job and levels the It does, yeah. Some of them are, some of them it's going to be kind of impossible just because they've heaved so much that. Uh, yeah. But. Remember that one used to be really bad. Oh, yeah. We walk by that all the time. If you <clears throat> walk over, you'll see just like a couple holes. And it's all like leveling that, yeah. out, yeah. So if we have a couple ideas to take to the residents, um, what's your thoughts? going forward then as far as bringing them all together at time frame and how we're going to do that? Um, I would think for adequate notice, we'd be looking at late September, um, you know, give about a two week notice. Um, Tim, they have a Facebook group over there, don't yeah. they? In some yeah, various I'll, states. I'll, I can post that. Late September is good. I'm, not, I'm out in the middle of the month. So okay. Later. Yeah. Okay. Um, we just have a community meeting. Is that, is that what you're thinking? I'm just thinking we have a neighborhood meeting and talk about the sidewalks and the trees and what we've found to date. I'll have it organized pretty well. Um, trying to think of what was on the second page. I had a cautionary note about if, if we're going to take ownership of the trees, the street trees and the damage that they potentially have created, then we probably need to look at our rewriting our ordinance because it is, you know, right now it just says you own the sidewalk. Um, you know, there's some precedents with that also that would come along with it. Um, those were a couple of my cautionary points. And then I talked about next steps, which would be talk with the community, the neighborhood, come back, hopefully with a consensus from them, run it a final time by, uh, the services committee and then commit to a direction that we're going to go. Um, one of the things that might have ended up in here was um, they had a, and I will send it via email, Tree City USA had a real good thing about how sidewalks and trees can coexist, talked about some of the barrier kind of approaches, different things you can do to kind of keep roots, encourage them to go in places that you want them to go and not go where they where you don't want them to go. 
but they kind of recommended if if you think you're going to remove a panel and that that tree is going to be subjected to some root cutting that in the fall you 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 make sure that you trim it and prune it and then in the spring you do the the cutting and replacement of the sidewalk so that the the tree has you know a reasonable season to kind of recover from being put under that stress so i think timing wise we'd probably still want to do the actual sidewalk replacement pieces of it in the spring just to have the best chance of the of of not stressing the trees and having them survive so is there many you said there's some towns or cities who take ownership of that versus a lot that don't and the majority don't um uh, yeah i apologize this um granville bexley westerville um delaware upper arlington there's five communities that i remember off the top of my head that take ownership um Oh, actually, it's it's attached to this memo. There's uh, it should have the 2019 Central Ohio sidewalk policies and procedures. It oh, okay. the forester provided me with this kind of synopsis of who's doing what um, and who's taking. I don't think Columbus takes ownership of trees from the way I could see it. Um, we just talking about like getting a good price. If we're getting getting a bids and then adding it to the sewer bill, would not that kind of how we were talking about <clears throat> doing that? Or I forget. Um, if 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 we do it as a replacement, we would do an assessment process for it. Comes under tax bill. Yeah. Tax bill. Okay. It just goes on the county tax bill. Yeah. That's how it goes. It's one possible approach. Okay. If we don't want to pay for it or. Uh, I mean, I don't think we should set precedent to really take ownership of that, should we? I mean, it doesn't the already exist. Homeowners so. own the trees and own their sidewalk, own that property. I thought that's kind of what we decided last week or last meeting was, you know, we would help facilitate the repairs, but the homeowners were going to have to pay for it, wouldn't it? We own the trees, the homeowner owns the sidewalk. Okay. And they own the responsibility I, as is to repair the sidewalk. I do wonder if we can get the sidewalk and the trees repaired this time on our on us going forward, maintaining the homeowner's responsibility. And that's and that's we what we talked keep, about yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. And we can keep a little better watch of it going forward. We want some notices to people that you got to get your sidewalk yeah. fixed before it gets out of hand. Yeah. And would it, in that replacement or fix, are we talking about the village would uh, actually coordinate the entire neighborhood, whatever could be ground down? That's that's what would be fixed, and then anything that needed to be replaced would be assessed potentially to the mm -hmm. homeowner. Because there are some that are like this high that you'll never be able to grind it. Right. right enough to yeah they they're comfortable up to about an inch and a half and after they they say they're sacrificing too much of the depth of the sidewalk right so i mean you know i ordinances from liability standpoint too many you can leave it you know yeah well it's not going to be a problem it's 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 going to be a problem the concrete that lifts it. What was that called again? Subjacking or yeah, hydraulic so lifting. I, mean, I think that sounds like a good option too. I mean, between those two options, we should be able to do fix a good portion of it, shouldn't we? Without having to cut them out and redo the whole slab. Um, probably there there are some that are really severe, and I think we we even want to do one or two of those just on an exploratory basis to see what's happening underneath them. Yeah, right. Um, so we can, uh, and that may be a good opportunity then to try some of the barrier type of approaches to kind of slow that tree down from going in that direction. 
Um, you cut it up and go to replace it. Is that what you mean? Um, do the barrier when you're doing that. Hopefully, if if the tree can be saved, there's some some ways that you can set up physical barriers. There's a a barrier that's got a little bit of. Um, no oh, shoot, can't think of the word fungicide in it that you know when the tree root hits it, it dies, so it doesn't go any further. Mm. Um, so you know it might give us an opportunity to experiment with a couple <clears throat> different ways to kind of get that if we find a root is the cause to to uh, get it under control, and then if it's you know, a major root, if it's more than three or four inches, it's being cut, it's going to compromise the health and the stability of the tree. So at that point, that tree's got to come out and we've got to get a more appropriate tree in there. Yeah. So if we do that, we will be responsible for replacing the trees that need to come out. Is that right? Since we own the trees? I would mean, think right? so. Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. Otherwise, somebody could put in whatever... They please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then going into this meeting with homeowners, we now your three different remediations are all irrespective of funding, right? It's just solutions for repairs. Um, no, I think we need to tell them, you know, how each one would be funded. So I agree. So um, I need. I need to understand your position, which um, is, I heard we would do the slicing of the sidewalk for the minor ones and slab jacking. But if it comes to being a panel replacement, that would be at the homeowner's expense. Is that what that's, I heard? That's been one option that was discussed, I think, at least in one mm -hmm. of these meetings. It seemed like the most reasonable reset mm -hmm. button for this scenario. I I would agree with that. I'm fine with that. that you know, yeah. I just need to know. That's on what it would, I forget. It. It's about yeah. 50 grand on not including trees, wasn't it? For, the, grind, right. for the grinding? No, it was less than 40. Okay. okay. Um, Which one did that amount to for the affected homeowners? Do we? Did we figure that out? Um, some will have a bill, some will not. You know, there's there's some folks that have maintained their sidewalk. There's been some sections replaced. Okay. So uh, it would end up being an individualized, you know, kind of bill. Tabulation. I think if some of the residents have already done repairs to their own sidewalks too, yep. that this is the most fair way to go, you know, well, so sort of in deference to the people that have already paid for their own repairs. I was say, I mean, the yeah. ones that already paid for it, and then they see that we're paying for their neighbor's stuff to get fixed, they're going to be mad. I yeah. be. They're like, hey, I took care of my stuff, and I had to pay for it, and now they're getting a free pass. I mean, honestly, that's I, I'm kind of in favor of saying the neighbors have to pay for Everybody has to pay for it themselves. We'll facilitate the equipment, and we'll get a group rate discount. But, you know, your neighbor down the street did a slapjack on his and your neighbor over here cut his out and replaced it and everybody else was maintaining their stuff. And you knew when you bought your house that this was your responsibility and you're not maintaining it. So now we're going to force you to. I mean, I, I'm a vet. That's my position. That's what I think, because the people who already did it and stayed on top of it like they're supposed to, they're, they're kind of being punished. That's. That's how I would look at that if I was the neighbor taking care of my own stuff. So, I don't that know. Was, that's just my opinion. <laughs> and that was my second cautionary. You know, cautionary was mm -hmm. first was, you know, are we going to take ownership of the trees? And the second cautionary is some people could raise the issue of fairness because they had. Yeah. I mean, I think. How would you? So, if you were going to assess it to, let's say, everybody, how do we go about calculating that? I, I, I agree with Martin that, you know, based on the people that have already done repairs, I mean, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So then we're down to going to each property location. Um, we've got the census of the slicing. We can come up with a, you know, because they charge on a rate. So we can calculate that out. We can get a, a concrete person to quote us a price for panel replacement. 
um, but it would be a matter of delivering an individual bill to each homeowner. I think we, I think we need to, when we're going to have our community meeting, we need to put a notice on the front door of all the people that we've identified that have a problem and tell them this directly affects you. We need you at this meeting or else we're going to make a decision for you. And then we could do a neighborhood invite to everyone else and say, we're going to talk about this. You know, if you didn't have a note on your door, it doesn't directly affect you right now, but it will soon, you know, if you don't maintain your sidewalk, because we're going to, we're going to have to have it maintained. That's just our community standards. So I think that we should do that, put a note on their door, say, this is our meeting. We're going to discuss our options and the action that needs to be taken, you know, and if you don't show up to, to voice your, put your input in, then we'll make a decision for you and we'll put it on your tax bill. I mean, it gives them plenty of opportunity to come and participate in the communication, I think. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? I like a <laughs> gently worded version of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, we're not. No yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I agree. I think that's a good idea. Uh, to notify the people who are, I mean, we did, did we do something similar when we had the street tree problem in you guys' neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Directly, yeah, yeah. I, got something with my I think uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so let me see if there's a way that we could bill it through our sewer system, our regular monthly billing, and then if it's in arrears, put a lien on the property taxes because otherwise you're going to spend as much setting up a system to do it sure as you would spend sure. fixing it and that yeah. but if we could just tag it on the sewer bill if we have a property identified and okay yeah i think that would i mean it seems like it would be a smooth way to do it if it's possible i don't know yeah oh. i mean if it's possible but then we could say look here's a group rate that we've mm -hmm. identified by hiring this contractor to come and knock it all out at once. And the contractor could even leave his individual price and be like, look, if you don't, if you weren't going to participate in this, or if you were to do it on your own, it would cost you this much more. But I don't know. I think, I think just notifying those people and yeah, if we could just do it all and get it paid for and bill them, that'd be the easiest, I would think. One thing I would say if I was a homeowner, though, I would say, okay, I, and I've driven through the neighborhood, so I can validate that with my own eyes, and I know the data proved this out as well. Like over 80 or 90% of the heaving is directly related to the maples that are in the right of way that are our responsibility to maintain and never have. And so I was reading through all these different municipal codes, which our code does not say this. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Legally, we're justified in exactly what you, you just said. But almost every one of these is like, if a tree, you know, in the tree lawn caused the sidewalk, you know, the village or the municipality will come by, replace the, uh, replace the tree, remove the tree. And then probably the most lenient is Granville says, you know, we'll cover 50% of the cost. And almost every other one of these, it says, the municipality will call, will replace the sidewalk. Again, our code doesn't say that, but that's mm -hmm. generally how these municipalities are handling it. Most of them are covering the cost of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the homeowner pays nothing when a tree is damaged to concrete. Uh, sidewalk damage. Uh, not due to a tree root damage village will pay 50 percent of replacement costs and that's granville and then it says if the sidewalk damage is due to tree root damage the village will pay the entire cost of the replacement virtually every one of these is well i mean do we want to just do it that way and just plan on moving forward to cover the cost for everybody i don't know Expensive, but. One caught my eye here, and that was Hilliard. Yeah, yeah, Jason, the homeowner, is responsible for addressing any sidewalk heaved in excess of an inch. If the city tree has caused the issue, the city will remove the tree. 
replace the affected panels and replay it a more appropriately sized tree. If the homeowner wishes to retain the tree, they have to mitigate the raised sidewalk. So if the switch that, that seems like one of the most reasonable ones out of it all does, of them, yeah. when, it, when you're talking about, okay, does the municipality find value in trees? If so, they're going to, they're going to own the liability associated with it. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not saying that's exactly what needs to happen in this case. I just, if I were a homeowner, I would say, yeah, I bought this house the tree is yours and the tree caused my sidewalk to heave and you're asking me to pay for it the code says that that's what's supposed to happen but it also says we're supposed to maintain the trees in the right way i mean going back to what we were just talking about earlier too it could be that we pay for remediation this time and at that meeting we tell them going forward hey, you're going to be responsible for the for the sidewalk replacements, unless there's future tree issues, which we should have solved for by that point. I just, I don't, I don't like that. I feel like we got to go one way, all in, one way or the other. Because you say this time around we'll pay for it, but then five years from now, somebody who this will be their for first last time, time, their yeah. first time. I mean, you know, they'll be like, "Hey, you pay for these guys their first time." And why aren't you paying for ours? I think it's, I feel like we're either going to have to be all in on covering it all or all out. Or maybe, you know, we cover like. Or a plan like this Hilliard one, where if the tree's responsible for it, we do it. If not, it's on you. Yeah. But the tree's responsible for it, what? 80% of the time? 90%. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, really it's a very high percentage. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. I like that too. And say, if you don't want to have it, you know, we're going to take care of it. We're cutting a tree down and putting an appropriately sized one in. If you want to keep that tree, then you take care of all of this, right? Uh, you said it? Yeah, that's, what mm -hmm. that's not a bad deal. So no, you I don't can, think so. We'll take care of it for you, or you take care of it all, but it's up to you. I'm okay with that, too. I just think we need to go one way, all in, yeah. really. You know, they're all so in, pay for it, way, all in one way, way and I think that that makes a lot more sense and it's more it's going to be more fair to everyone doing it that way yes sir please <laughs> no no i uh, I, I just a uh, just an observation from a unbiased observer uh this isn't i don't have a dog in this fight uh so a couple of things that, that struck me uh, one i'd be curious how this scales up to the entire community uh once it leaves some various states. I don't need an answer, just things I've noticed. Second, in an, in an assessment project, uh, assessment projects are very expensive to pull off and they take a lot of my time. Uh, you, you need me involved as well uh, to do a bunch of stuff, a bunch of notices, a bunch of estimates, uh, a whole bunch of good, good things, a lot of council action. Um, but in an assessment project, it, isn't automatically put on the taxes. The first thing that happens is the homeowner is offered an opportunity to pay the bill. Right. So if you were to send me a bill for 350 bucks, personally me, I'm paying it. I'm, you know, I'm not gonna mess with having you put it on the taxes and have it on there as an assessment and having a possible issue whenever I go to sell my house that I have to clear the assessment before the buyer will take possession, right? Um, now, I'm, I'm not, Average Joe, I'm a little so it might be hard for an average Joe to pay a three hundred fifty dollar uh, bill, but there is an opportunity for them to do that. Before you, and then and then another observation: before you get too far down this road about what just we'll just attach it to the sewer bill. I think we need Mr. Breen to lay in on that pretty yeah. yeah. heavily yeah. Um, because I'm I'm uncomfortable personally with that. Uh, um, so. Um, uh, just sitting here. Um, so those are those are some of the observations. I don't want to get into your decision making process of all in, part in, first time, all that. That's your your uh, prerogative to to decide those features. But I just wanted to kind of uh, just mention those things that I mentioned. And considering how it scales up to the city is a good question. Um, of course, in most of the developments and all the developments to come, there will not be street trees. Right. So, so really, this is the only one that's really going to be. And you guys' neighborhood. 
Well, uh, no, but the entire well, downtown yeah, area. The, these are the very, very, very expensive trees to manage. Yeah. I mean, we've taken down, uh, I forget what kind of tree it was, but it was like a hundred <laughs> foot tall tree and it cost like $2,000 yeah. plus the concrete damage and one tree. Yeah, it's a lot. I agree with scale up. I, I also think it's very important to get the feedback from the residents. So going in with, here's what our code says. Like, if we don't bend anything, the responsibility is yours. And that's, that's like our, you know, stance at the current moment. But we've been exploring ways to address this. And we're looking at, uh, you know, amending the code, which is what we've been talking about for at least three or four months now. And coming up with a reasonable way forward. And hearing what they have to say, I mean, I'd love to have the people who have already replaced their sidewalks come to the meeting too. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the voice you really want to hear. The people who have owned it and followed the rules and, you know, tried to address it. Either way, you're going to have people that are upset. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, the ones that you can't are make everybody happy ever. ever the right. ones that already did. Right. <clears throat> okay. Good. So... Um, well, I, I will commit the options in a better format to writing and I will and I did make the note that we'd have to ask Mr. Bream about the ability to bill. Mm -hmm. um, so. yeah. okay. And then we can talk about the funding from the standpoint of what we're already doing and that we're exploring other options when we have the meeting. The group rate easy. fix would be a, a good sell to the residents. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could explain like, okay, this same amount of space is gonna cost you $800, or if we went all in as a team and do this together and everybody pays their fair share, you know, it's gonna cost you $300. That, that argument or explanation is going to go a long way i think with the residents yeah i think so and and that that's been proven to me in in assessment sidewalk assessment projects i've done where we we provided the opportunity for the homeowner to make his own repair we gave them six weeks you know here's here's the deficiencies we noted our council said that we would give the homeowners a chance to fix it themselves uh, those that did paid roughly $20 a square foot to repair the sidewalks because they did them, you know, 20 square feet at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Those that said, now let the city do it. The city got $6.50 a square foot when they did the project out. Okay. Now the homeowners had to pay a little bit. They had, they had to pay the assessment costs on top of that, um, but uh, way less than if they'd have done it themselves. And some people were smart and the whole block got together. And uh, and so they got a better price because they did it bigger. But uh, Joe, you're spot on. It, it, if we allow the individual homeowners to do it, they almost always pay two or three times what it would cost them if they just got on board with our program. Mm -hmm. well, I like that idea. Yeah, the assessment thing and give them the option ahead of time and, and do it and we take care of it. Okay, uh, moving on then, um, update on stormwater. This one I don't think I had talked to you about, Steve. The Welkman. I'll, I'll field this one. Yeah. Uh, it's, okay. in, it's in my court uh, council, I believe, or at, at the very least the committee uh, directed us to prepare uh, a, a simple plan and profile that Brad could provide to a couple of contractors he knows to make the corrections. The survey was completed on Monday. It's currently, it's called base mapping. They take all the electronic information that's inside the fancy machine and they turn it into a drawing for me. And then we can uh, turn that into plan profile stuff. And so that's where it is. I expect it'll come back to me either Friday or, or maybe Tuesday or uh, next week. Uh, if you would allow me maybe a week or 10 days to kind of gnaw on it and get it, get it scribbled up and polished up. Uh, so I, I think somewhere around the middle of September, September 15th, there about a couple of days either way, uh, we'll be able to deliver a, um, <clears throat> a drawing to Brad that he can get quotes from contractors to uh, to make the repair. Okay. Um, then we also have an update on objects in the right-of-way. 
notices were given. Mm -hmm. um, I think the 30 days will be probably this during the second week of September. So I'll make rounds and see if everyone has complied with getting it out of the right away. And those that have not um, will cause to have them removed from the right of way. Did that, did that include the one that's on the telephone pole down here on Cherry? Oh, because I point, just drove yeah. by that yesterday and saw. Also, we have a fence code uh, violation, I meant to tell you, on Cindy Cooper Street. I was driving through that street and uh, there's a person building a fence all the way to the sidewalk. On a corner lot? Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'll forget if I don't tell you now. So. And he's actually. <laughs> it's being built right now. Well, and if it's if it's at a private or a non privacy level, as long as it's a decorative fence, you can do that. The corner lot, and it's all the way up against the sidewalks. And they can have a decorative fence. Okay. The whole, and they've got the slats and everything in it. Cedar. Solid. Or is it just the cedar dog eared solid five and a half, maybe six foot fence? Okay. Yeah, that's okay. All right. You mean they didn't Detroit. put in what they told you they were going to put in? I'm shocked. <laughs> so it's fine if it's a little wrought iron fence or something like that, but if it's a big, it has to have privacy fence. That's okay. Yeah, I think Steve's right. It has to be three and a half feet maximum height and has to have 50% open, open openness within mm. the face of the It was still 50% open, aka 50% complete. <laughs> 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 okay. In violation, yeah. Just leave every other slide. Who, who is who, that? That house on uh, that backed up to uh, North Miller that put in a, a panel, an eight foot panel, had an eight foot panel missing, another eight foot panel. That was fifty percent. David, what did Steve talk about? I just didn't see what that Okay. Okay. Sorry. Huh. Um, okay, uh, and then at some point, I know we had mentioned uh, creating a streetscape plan at some point too, um, in relation to this discussion around uh, serve, right? Just something I wanted to throw out there okay. for future consideration. Traffic impact study. That sounds like the big uh, new business topic for tonight. Dave, are you going to speak to that? I, I can answer questions to it. Um, I can give a little bit of context in the background. Yeah, yeah. So um, there was a traffic impact study completed um, at the direction of the Big Walnut Local School District related to the uh, new elementary and the high school that's being built at the north end of Kinder Parkway. And some of the output, the way that traffic impact studies work is they do what's called an open opening year um, design and, or excuse me, opening year improvements that are, re that are needed, required, and then design year, which is typically 10 years out from the day of opening. So in this case, it's 2022. In 2032, so year 2022 is the year the high school is opening, um, and and what it's what a traffic impact study is attempting to do is two things: one, assess and project future uh, traffic impact, and then also uh, in most cases there's some mitigation or additional lanes, in other words, or additional signaling that mitigates the traffic impact. And anytime that you have what's called a failed intersection, which is basically where you have an intersection, it backs all the way through the next intersection, that's called an intersection failure. And so what you're attempting to do is not only maintain the level of grading, but not fail any intersections. So um, if you went from, it's like a grading scale, like A, B, C, D, F, I think. Um, there's an E in there. But there's an E in there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, you don't want to decrease your level of service to the point where you have intersection failures. The short version, what you have in your packet this evening and what Mr. Parkinson has done a really nice job of 
is uh, taking the output from the traffic impact study and then adding some of the context or the bubbles in this case, the boxes, and explains what actual improvements need made by 2032 so we don't have a massive amount of failing intersections. Um, and you, you know that we just uh, installed the additional turn lane, we called it the West Cherry Street turn lane. Um, in front of the uh, fire department, advanced auto, Wendy's, turning north on Miller. But the next pages are the more important ones um, and are the, the more pertinent ones. And those are the ones that uh, are impending and imminently impending, in my opinion. Um, traffic studies can be outdated. Some of the methodologies can be flawed, but generally, I think you'll agree that we will have significant traffic impact on all of these areas, especially on 3637, aka Cherry Street, uh, Kintner, and Miller Drive, as uh, Miller Drive feeds on to Route 3. The, the short version of what I'm covering here is I uh, wanted to get this in front of you not only early, this is probably actually late, um, but want to get it in front of you often so we can start discussing a very strategic approach to the traffic improvements because if you, anybody drives between 7 15 and 8 o'clock in the morning anywhere throughout the village knows the impact that we have right now and knows how serious it's going to be on miller drive kintner parkway cherry street route three um, in the very near future and we're the only uh, body that's going to address this. So we are not going to, you know, be, there's nobody that's going to rescue us. We are, we are going to become a city in a week or two. Uh, this is our responsibility to keep free flowing traffic, keep the public safe. It's also our responsibility uh, to develop very sound financial means to pay for this without burdening the existing tax base. So um, high level, this is a couple million to 3 million to 4 million, depending on you know, how you spend this. Uh, some other things that we're looking at is, yeah, per approximately. Per. Not per, um, I mean, you could probably say $500,000 for each improvement or thereabouts. I mean, that's a, a round number, yeah. three to $500,000. If you add them all up, you're talking multiple millions of dollars mm -hmm. in the near term future. Our entire streets program this year, we spent $544,000. So we're talking you know, six, seven times that amount and most likely a shorter amount of period of time while our current roads are deteriorating. So these are not only not only walking but chewing gum at the same time we need to do we need to do both i mean we got about 15 items that need addressed in the next 10 years basically 15 some overlap but yeah some, yeah, some are uh, some some are uh stitch three or four of those together into one project mm -hmm. you wouldn't do just one of these at a time some of them make up bigger projects but to put numbers to it uh Clangers, who did the original study a number of years ago, estimated that these improvements on the two sheets that have all the annotations on it uh, totaled about two and a half million dollars. Um, their estimate of the turn lane was 20% off. Um, so if you scale that up, these costs were three million dollars uh, a couple of years ago. So they're probably three and a quarter million today. And there are no engineering fees in that number. So there's no design, no inspection, and there's no right-of-way cost in those numbers. So there, there will be right-of-way acquisition required for uh, many of these, uh, especially the bigger improvements. And uh, those costs are not included in that figure either. Utility movement. Do we have they, they have, they have broad brush budgets in there for that. But if we run into something that they, something special, we have a fiber that's got to be relocated that can get expensive. Um, so, yeah. So ballpark, I mean, if we're talking total for the whole thing, like five to seven million probably, or is that? I wouldn't, I wouldn't get crazy. I think if you want to use five million as a, as a talking point number today, I think you're probably getting pretty close. 
Kind of develop a schedule, right? Yeah. Of what Put a we plan do. together of what order, how many, what fits into which project, and basically start on it as soon as we can. Like next year? Yeah, like well, now. Yeah. And we've been when I say we've been working on it, we've been we've been aware of this. Right. Anybody who is in any of the discussions around the school and zoning mm -hmm. and we were aware of this. It's it's now it's crunch time. Yes, um, schools are going to be open, mm -hmm. and we're going to be playing from behind. I've, I've used that reference several times, but we're playing from behind in terms of. I, I saw an intersection fail this morning. You know, it, it was backed up to UDF on Miller Drive. It's backing up past uh, GRE, past up where the middle school you would turn down mm -hmm. barley corn. And it's that's an intersection failure. That's that's where you really we didn't have that issue. intersection. No, nobody nobody it steps is. down Heartland to try to get around that. <laughs> There'd be a turn lane on Route Three going south from Miller. Gotcha. It, it, I'm, I'm surprised sorry. people didn't go down Hartford and try to sneak out Sunbury Meadows. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah. um, so it, it isn't. Uh, yeah, we're 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 going to catch up, and and that's not unusual for roads uh, because they're expensive, and you want to wait until you really know you have a need before you go and spend the money to fix them. In this case, we know we have a need at least right here. There's our first big need that we we could uh, focus on, um, and um, we're pretty sure that once the high school opens, these other weak points are going to show themselves. Yeah. One thing that the high school, with the opening of the high school, that uh, the high school will do for two or three years, I can't remember the committed time frame, they will actually have an officer on Miller Drive. So if you think parents or folks are dropping off their kids and they're trying to head south on Miller Drive past Noah's Ark to go onto either Cherry Street or continue on Miller, the intersections in, in, on Miller, and I'm talking about the neighborhoods feeding in to go south, will be backed up so long that the estimates were an hour back up to get out, out of the neighborhoods. So the high school is committed to have um, a traffic cop there for two to three years. And then after that, you know, that falls off and that's, that doesn't fix anything. That is a, that is a, sh a small prednisone yeah. shot that is going to cure your today pain, but the, the cause and the issue is not going away until we fix it with a joint replacement. Yeah, we should probably start there, shouldn't we? Or where? At Miller Drive at the intersection of Miller Drive. That's the, that's the big ticket item right there. Um, I might suggest a smaller first bite, but uh, you know that would be uh, you get you get bang for your buck at that intersection. But we we need the most right away right there, probably. I definitely think that uh, you know. A week after that high school opens up, you're going to have people calling and complaining about the traffic in the area. So it's nice to at least have a plan that we can say well, we have sure. identified it and we know that, you know, it's something we're going to have to work on. We have one, um, one card in our pocket and that's Kentner. So if, if Miller gets too bad, uh, Kentner might be, we might have to find a, a way to better utilize Kentner uh, in, in the uh, tra flow of traffic in and out of the school. And so at least we're not not committed to just a single point of entry and exit. But, uh, it, uh, um, you know, when we talked about this, uh, I mean, even the existing high school, which has two or three ways in, is a real mess for 10 or 15 minutes every morning and yeah. down Columbus and Letts and places like that. And, and even uh, I think trying to get out of Letts going on to 37 out on the east side, I think I've been told it it's hard to get out of there sometimes with all the traffic driving up that road to go to the intermediate school and the back door to the high school. So, you know, it's just an awful lot of traffic in a very short time and, and you're going to get these little you know, these little uh, backups. So uh, you know, these these uh, these. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a uh, not to take too much time. I know I don't have much. I, I I watched the city engineer for Columbus explaining to council about an, a big improvement he wanted to do on Sawmill Road, and he explained all about how it was an F. 
it's an F today and we need to spend $3 million to, to fix this intersection. And the council, someone on council said to him, will that make it a C? He goes, no, it'll still be an F, but it'll be a better F. Right. You know, and, um, and, and there's a little bit of truth to that even here. We're going to have 10 or 15 minutes where this is still going to be an F, right. even with all these, these efforts. But overall, it'll be a better F, and overall, it'll work better after that peak. So I, I highly recommend, first of all, Steve, this document, can you get out to all of council? Um, just make sure that they have it available. Maybe we'll even mention it in a council meeting. But then I, I would recommend that you guys peel these couple pages off and keep it with you with all your council documents because we're going to come back and revisit this. And I'm sure you haven't had time to read through every one, but there are very detailed descriptions that Mr. Parkinson added in here. Yeah. No help. <laughs> for next year starting right mm -hmm. especially if you want to do, uh, you want to do these repairs over here while the school is paying for the traffic out yeah. Hi. Are there grants or anything that we can help with this? There are, but we can talk about yeah. funding sources. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, head on any of this stuff. This, this I is I'm not even sure estimates. what it is. So, uh, do you know anything about it? Or I, I do. Know? They they put together cost estimates. I just haven't seen it in the agenda. Okay. No, I didn't have it in the agenda. But yeah. If you want to hit on it, sure. Steve or Dave, would you guys mind hitting on the most recent uh, Sunbury Mills tree replacement discussion? I didn't see it on any of the agendas for council, but it is in some of the services packet. Um, yeah, we put together uh, at, at the request of council, I believe, uh, a tree replacement plan. We actually put two together. Uh, we put one at the direct that was specifically at the direction uh, of council, which was to replace a given number. And then as we prepared that, it seemed a little that we came up short. So we added another 14 to make a complete replacement of all of the trees that have been removed uh, from the neighborhood. And so those are the two different plans that we prepared, one at, that was as directed and the other that, in, that replaced all of the trees that have been removed. Um, don't know. Yeah. So um, we uh, we estimated the cost uh, to be roughly twenty four thousand dollars, I believe, and we suggested an, another twenty five hundred for contingencies because you'll find something as he's out there digging. Um, yeah, twenty six five. And so 26.5, and that was for the full replacement where we added the extra 14. I think we had 20,000 uh, to replace the trees that we were directed to replace, which was 50 of them. Um, and then another uh, 2,000 for the contingencies. The uh, recommendation was to, where we wouldn't need to go out to a full bid because basically the cost benefit of going out to bid we're going to spend four or five thousand dollars on bid documents, and we could just go out with the requirements that you provided to a couple of suppliers to see who can meet our requirements. So I don't know if that requires a motion or a, an ordinance of council, but it's a it's a it's a it's a price that I don't believe requires bidding. Um, so you could um, competitively quote it, if you will. Just ask three or four or five landscape companies, give them the plans. We'll give you a couple of specs on planting and warranty and things of that nature that you can include with it, and they and tell them, hey, we need your we need your quote by a date, and then you pick the the best quote, uh, the quote that you find of, of best value to you, uh, which may or may not be the lowest quote, and then you uh, award award them uh, the work. Um, we uh, we can help you at any point along the way, but I believe. At least I've been functioning thus far that we're trying to minimize our involvement in order to reduce the cost. Um, and so, if if uh, if Brad's group uh, has the uh, time and ability to uh, do the inspections per se, or to assist with uh, uh, soliciting uh, vendors, uh, uh, 
go for it. Steve, do you need counsel to authorize you to go out to get quotes for this, or does this body? Um, eventually, I think I could go out and get quotes. I don't have the money to do it yet. I don't think it's been appropriated. I agree, but like when we want to get the quote before we appropriate yeah. it, yeah. So sure. you could do, we can you could just go out and get the quotes based on the requirements that Mr. Parkinson provided, bring back the quotes and determine if council wants to take action on the quotes. Okay. So so the my question for Steve is do we want quotes for the 50 tree replacement plan or the 64 tree replacement plan? David, you're the you're you're the uh Ultimate person. Uh, yes. <laughs> How about just yes? Uh, I think for the full replacement is what we need to look at. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any suggestion? Fifty trees and then like an alternate bid for sixty-four. We get that. Sorry, I'm late. No, I'm jumping. Sure. Yeah, I can get both prices. That's a good idea. Because we've got two separate plans and it calls out location and amount. So sure, you've already got that information to be able to Yeah, and I think I think the 50 trees are the exact same 50 trees in the 64 plan. We just populated the missing tree. I don't think we moved or changed any of the, the tree types between yeah, the 50 and the 64. Market. So yeah, that wouldn't be hard to do. I don't think, Steve. Just, just another layer. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, roll. Um, Mr. Fisher. Yes. Mr. Elliott. Yes. Mr. Kaplan. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to jump in. No, that was a good call.